Present. Chair Daines. Present. Representative Cotiza Watoon. Present. Representative Liebling. Present. Representative Schultz. Present. Representative O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, present. Senator Dornick. Present. Senator Drahein. Senator Drahein. Present. Senator Utke. Senator Utke. Senator Klein. Here. We do have a uh, quorum in both uh, bodies. So we have a quorum. Members, we are here today because there is a uh, potential conference committee report for our consideration. Uh, what we will do is have a couple of procedural motions to get that report in front of us. Uh, then we will have nonpartisan staff review the report for us, and then we will discuss and vote on the report. Uh, first, Senator Dames, would you like to move adoption of the conference committee report to get it in front of us? So moved. Senator Dames moves adoption of the conference committee report on Senate file 3472, House file 3717 to get before the committee. I will move the amendment coded A22-0401. A22 we will now have nonpartisan staff walk through the amendment, starting with Ms. Pompu from House Research and Mr. Mum from Senate Fiscal. Chair and members, Larry Pompu, House Research. I can walk through the policy provisions first and then um, allow Casey to do the fiscal portion of it. Wonderful, Ms. Pompu. So starting on page one, uh, we have a transfer, which uh, Mr. Mum will cover. Uh, section two moves the operation of the premium security plan so that it operates between years 2023 and 2027. Section three involves private health insurance. It requires health plans to cover comprehensive postnatal visit, post visits at three weeks postpartum and 12 weeks postpartum and any visits recommended by a provider in between those two dates. And that has an effective date of January 1st, 2023. Section four involves private health insurance. It involves prescription drug benefits. It requires that health plan companies offer individual and small group health plans that have a pre-deductible flat dollar copay structure for their silver and gold metal plans. Um, New and added in conference committee is uh, a system by which if a health plan company um, has fewer than 75 enrollees in a gold or silver plan that meets these requirements, they can discontinue that type of plan. It requires them to notify enrollees, offer a health, uh, alternative health plan on a guaranteed basis and not take their decision, uh, not take into regard um, anyone's health status as part of making their decision. They have to report to the Commissioner of Commerce about enrollment in these types of plans. And this is effective January 1st, 2024. On to section five. This changes the date by which funds in the Minnesota Premium Security Plan have to be deposited in the Healthcare Access Fund. It was at June 30th, 2024. This moves it to June 30th, 2029. We have a repealer in section 40 which changes a date to 2024. And that relates to the transfer in section one that Mr. Mom was discussing. In section seven, this uh, sets up dates for health plans to file proposed rate filings for the 2023 benefit year. Uh, this section is effective the day following the enactment. Section eight involves transfers, which Mr. Mom will get into. Section nine, appropriations. Um, it looks like those have a contingent, the appropriation in section nine um, is contingent on the approval of the continuation of the state innovation waiver. And that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Pompu. Mr. Mom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I'll just briefly go through the spreadsheet uh, summarizing the fiscal aspects of the bill. Um, the amounts are to finance uh, three years of the reinsurance program's operation, as well as 
um, costs uh, associated uh, with uh, MNsure and Minnesota Care resulting from the reinsurance program. Um, if you're looking at the spreadsheet, uh, the first item of attention is on line five. These are two transfers from the general fund into the premium security plan account. The first is 300.092 million in fiscal year 23. And the second is a $229 million, $465,000 transfer in fiscal year 25. Uh, that's a total amount of 529 million, 557,000. Um, the second item is on line 17. Um, um, Mr. This Chair, is... I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, do we have I'm, this... I'm sorry, do we have this new spreadsheet? I don't think I've seen it. I believe it was sent around by Mr. Brown uh, shortly before the hearing, uh, but I, I, I... I got the bill language. I did not get a spreadsheet that I'm aware of. I guess I'd go back and look. Let's take a look here. Mr. Chair, if, if you would prefer, I can try to share my screen so that members would be able to view it. As well, I'm... I think we should make sure that members have the, the spreadsheet. We, as we well. do have it in email, but if you could share your screen, that might make it more convenient for us as well. We, I think maybe both would be a good idea, Representative okay. Schultz. But are we saying that, uh, Representative Schultz, you, you have located it? I email? do have it in front of me, yes. Chair. Yeah, yeah, Representative Liebling, Chair. have you located okay. it? I have not. I guess I'd have to open. I'll have to open my other computer. And pull I it up. will Sorry. ask Mr. Brown to resend it to you, so it's at the top of your email box. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. If you could resend the the email to conferees, uh, so it's at the top of their email box, and if you could enable Mr. Mum to share his screen as well, that would be uh, helpful. Will do, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Please proceed, Mr. Mum. Okay, uh, assuming that uh, this is visible, um, uh, the first item that I discussed was on line five. These are the, the transfers that I just went through. Uh, these are from the general fund into the premium security plan account to pay for the operations of the reinsurance program through fiscal year 26. That's funding uh, three years of the five-year extension. Um, the next item is on line 17. It is a $13.269 million transfer from the general fund into the Minsure Enterprise Fund. And this is to offset uh, premium withhold revenue uh, reductions uh, to Minsure that would result from uh, the reinsurance programs extension. Um, the second item uh, here is on line 18. These are transfer reductions um, to uh, the amounts uh, transferred under 16A724. Um, that uh, transfer is currently scheduled to expire after fiscal year 25. Um, what the bill is doing, uh, or the conference committee report is doing, is moving that uh, expiration up in a, one year. So there would be a $122 million transfer in fiscal year 25 that would not occur. So that's counted as a $122 million cost to the general fund. And uh, similarly, in fiscal year 24, the transfer amount is reduced uh, to 70.215 million. The resulting difference uh, between 122 million and 70.215 million is this 51.785 million that is counted as a cost to the general fund. Um, and the rationale for this will make, ex make sense when I get down to the healthcare access fund expenditures. Um, the total general fund costs are identified on lines 20 and 21. Uh, for the fiscal year, 20, the current biennium, uh, the total general fund cost is 313361000 And the general fund cost for the fiscal 24-25 biennium is 403250000 uh, the total combined is $716,611,000. Um, on line 24 are appropriations from the Healthcare Access Fund to Minnesota Care to make up for expected revenue losses um, from the federal government uh, for Minnesota Care's uh, operations. Um, these total $347,570,000 
over the course of the four years shown here. Um, of that total, half is paid for by reducing the amount of the transfer from the healthcare access fund to the general fund. And that uh, is on line 25. That is merely the inverse of the amounts shown on line 18. So it's shown as a cost to the general fund, but a savings to the healthcare access fund because the healthcare access fund would no longer be required to make those transferred amounts. Um, the, the net impact on the healthcare access fund is that the other half of the appropriations for Minnesota care um, just come out of the, the overall balance of the healthcare access fund. So that's why the total uh, amounts on lines 25 and 26 are identical at 173,785,000. Um, Mr. Chair, that's um, all I had for a spreadsheet walkthrough. And Mr. Mum, before you, uh, well, on line 24, uh, the appropriations out of the healthcare access fund are contingent on the lack of federal action uh, on uh, making uh, uh, fixing the BHP uh, problem. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, yes, that is correct. Right. So if there is federal action, the effect on the healthcare extra fund, uh, healthcare access fund uh, would be uh, different. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mom. Uh, so members, now that we have had the walkthrough, the next thing we will do is take a, what I am terming a procedural vote to adopt the amendment. This is not the vote to adopt the conference report that comes later, but we will vote to adopt the amendment to have it properly in front of us. And then we will have discussion uh, to uh, the conference report. Uh, all those in favor of adopting the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. We will now have discussion to the conference report. Members, uh, I will begin by saying that to me, uh, this is a compromise. Uh, the House uh, put forward a plan to do this differently. Uh, we would not, uh, it would be our preference to not solve the problems we have in the individual market uh, through reinsurance, uh, but through a public option. And we have on many occasions uh, made that clear. And uh, we've passed that bill in the past, uh, and that would be our preference. But we know that that is not uh, the course of action that the Senate is prepared to take. So having said that, there are 167,000 people in the individual market. Um, and uh, uh, we need to make sure that they don't suffer catastrophic premium increases uh, this fall. And uh, I want to put that in context. I asked uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, because we talk about numbers, we talk about percentages, but what does this mean for real people? I asked the Department of Commerce to give me some real numbers, because we have now a lot of experience with reinsurance, and we can run models with our actuaries that can tell us what would happen without the operation of the reinsurance program. And they were quick to point out correctly that the impact depends on where you live, how old you are, whether you use tobacco, and what benefit plan you use. But they can provide us with a range from sort of an example of what is the least expensive and thus the least impacted person by reinsurance to the most expensive. So if you take a child who's in the metro, so the cheapest area of the state and the cheapest person to insure, they would pay about $2,000 a year for a bronze plan under the proposed reinsurance program parameters, but would pay approximately $2,500 a year in absence of the reinsurance program. So that's an annual savings of $500 a year uh, for that uh, child. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, a 64-year-old uh, tobacco user who lives in Rochester would pay $18,600 per year for a gold plan under the proposed reinsurance program, but would pay $23,200 per year in absence of the reinsurance program for an annual savings of $4,600 a year per, per reinsurance. Both on a percentage basis and an absolute dollar basis, this is a very significant savings to Minnesotans that this program creates and is for many people the difference between affordable healthcare and unaffordable healthcare. I'm also very pleased that we were able to agree on two important reforms in the bill. A bill brought to conference through work by Representative Bierman to provide stable co-pays, I think is particularly valuable. Uh, right now, you could have a plan 
that has people paying thousands of dollars a year in January and February for life necessary prescription drugs, uh, which if you are living paycheck to paycheck on a bronze level plan, that is just not affordable. And we have seen people ration, self-ration, withhold the drugs they need, go without, make difficult decisions. But under the language that we are adopting today, that same individual will be able to get a plan uh, for the same cost that spreads that burden out over the entire year. And again, if you're living the paycheck to paycheck, that is really important. Uh, and for the thousands of people in Minnesota who have those conditions that need those prescription drugs, that's very valuable. The second point that I, the second uh, bill that uh, is being brought in this agreement is a bill authored by Representative Richardson uh, to increase uh, uh, coverage for maternal health. We've seen maternal health outcomes uh, going poorly in recent years, um, and uh, 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 particularly among uh, women of color. And so I think this is very important. And I'm really glad it's in the conference committee report. Last, the bill does appropriate $174 million into the healthcare access fund, ending a transfer that's in place for many years. Uh, we value the healthcare access fund and we'd like to see uh, the, the balance increase. So that is a material value from the House's perspective. Uh, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Zach, and certainly appreciate your outline of the bill and what it does. And uh, I would concur with your comments there. Uh, Another thing that I that you know I really appreciate the fact that we're able to get together. This gives the marketplace some stability, and uh, I know that the providers uh, like to have that stability to know what they can look forward to in the future. And I think the insureds also like that stability because uh, they know now that uh, there will be uh, at least three more years of health insurance that will have some support from this from the reinsurance part of it. Uh, with that said, uh, I was glad that we could get together last night with leadership and get it worked out and move this forward. And so I'll leave my comments there. Thank you, Senator Daines. Representative Liebel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, first of all, I had a question for nonpartisan staff uh, when we did the walkthrough on the language piece. I thought I heard something about a new provision that had not Come, I don't think was in either of the base bills, but maybe I'm wrong about that. And that had to do with discontinuing gold plans that had few people in them. And I wonder if I could just get some clarification on that. And you, yes, Representative Liebling, and I, I'll uh, uh, provide some context for that and then I'll hand it over to nonpartisan staff so they can uh, verify and add anything else. This relates specifically to the plans that are offered under the Bierman proposal. So under those, those plans offered under the Bierman proposal, there is a, 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 a modification to the guaranteed renewability law in order uh, that if very, very, very few people sign into them, uh, the plans after a period of time would be able to discontinue them under certain circumstances. Uh, Ms. Pompu, would you have further comment on that? No, Mr. Chair, um, I, uh, I think that covers it. But this, this uh, Representative Liebling, this relates only to plans authorized under the, 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 uh, the Bierman uh, proposal. Representative Liebling. Okay, well, that's, that's helpful, Mr. Chair. And so that's a modification to the Bierman proposal, Correct. I assume, that was not heard in the House and not considered elsewhere, but Correct. understood. It has a limited applicability. Okay, so I understand that. So... Um, I, I feel compelled to also make some comments about this deal. I do not support it. Um, first of all, I think uh, members know, uh, Republicans know, Democrats know that um, I and many of my colleagues, uh, many of my Democratic colleagues in the House consider reinsurance to be basically a bridge to nowhere. And we keep extending the bridge and it's still a bridge to nowhere. What we're doing here, first of all, I, I appreciate um, Representative Stevenson's talking about people who can't, can't obtain, uh, who struggle with paying for the very, very high cost of health insurance. That is indeed a real thing. But let's be very clear, health insurance is not health care. Health insurance is not health care. Even people who we can drive down the cost of the uh, premiums all we want, and a lot of people still can't afford to get the care when they need it because of the out-of-pocket costs. So let's be very clear about that. The Bierman bill 
help some people who have a particular kind of problem to spread out their payments over a period of time. That's all good. That helps a few people. That does nothing about the cost of care. It does nothing about the ultimate cost of drugs. It does nothing about the share of those pharmaceuticals that is being borne by those people. Nothing zeroes it. It just helps them spread it out and do their budgeting a little bit better, which I grant you is a very important for some people, but ultimately doesn't really solve much of a problem. The uh, Richardson bill that is uh, included here in, indeed is also very, you know, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. We all want, I think we all want, um, women who've given birth to get and their infants to get the best possible care. We are all for that. Actually, it's rather shocking to me that this isn't already something that happens all the time, that any insurance company would even would now be denying uh, to pay for visits for women who are being told that they need a visit or where their physician thinks they need a visit is absolutely shocking. So uh, while this is a good, good thing, I, I don't think it does a lot. And my understanding is that under the public programs, this is already covered. Uh, so I, I don't think that there's been much of a give here, frankly, from the Republicans on this, uh, on this bill. I wanna talk just a little bit about the things that the Republicans have refused to accept that were in our bill. And I wanna say again, doing reinsurance, extending the bridge to nowhere is a big give from the House DFL, a big give. And in this, I think we've, we've gotten far too little in this. This does nothing in many, many ways. So first of all, there's a very good provision in the House bill that would hold insurance companies accountable for mental health parity. This is already the law, already the law. And the House proposal to add some enforcement to that was rejected by Republicans. So I guess it's okay to have it in law that we're gonna hold the insurance companies accountable, but we're not gonna hold their feet to the fire when they don't. So I guess parity, Mental health parity that's been that's in law that's supposed to be the law that is so important right now, especially when we know that there are many, many folks have a lot of struggles with mental health and getting getting their mental health treatment they need, but we're not going to hold insurance feet to the fire, insurance companies. Um, there was a report in here, uh, just a report that has to do with. What would it look like if we could get the insurance companies out of our public programs? I, and frankly, many, uh, many Republicans in the House, I don't know what the talk is in the Senate, but in the House, many Republicans share my concern that the insurance companies who, who manage our public programs are not giving us a good deal. We spend billions and billions of dollars there with very little accountability for the public to the public and, and not getting what we think we're getting. And legislators have very little opportunity to really understand what's going on there because of the way this thing is run. So asking to have a report, just a report, was too much for Republicans to agree to, I guess. Then there's a public option proposal in the, um, in the bill, which Republicans, again, completely rejected. We've never heard a real Republican idea about how we're actually going to make sure people can get health care or hold down costs of health care. No, it's all about insurance, insurers, what we should give insurance companies. And this public option proposal, which would give us a potential, it's just to, you know, let's develop something and come back to the legislature and see whether it would work for people. But no, Republicans rejected that as well. So Mr. Chair, we, all of these things have been rejected by the Republicans. And yet in this deal, there are millions and millions of public dollars put again towards supporting insurance companies. Sure, it'll bring down the cost of insurance for some people somewhat. One of the um, examples that was given by the chair, if I got it right, was like from 23,000 to $18,000 a year. Oh my goodness, I mean, 18,000 is pretty darn unaffordable right there. So, you know, it just makes it maybe a little less unaffordable, 
it might control some of the sticker shock. We're spending many, many millions of taxpayer dollars to get that marginal effect, whatever it is. And under reinsurance, we don't even know what it's gonna be. And people who are getting the insurance are not gonna know. And, and, and then uh, finally, I do wanna say, the reason there are more people right now, as I understand it, the reason there are more people in the, in the marketplace now, in the small group and individual market, is because of the Biden administration's premium support, which has been capping people's out-of-pocket costs at, I believe it is 7% of their income. And that has worked very, very well. If people know that they won't have to spend more than 7% of their income, that is a great thing. And we could be doing that on the state level. We could, and, it, and if Republicans in the US Congress and the, the US Senate in particular would be willing to do it, we could extend it from the federal level too. That's in the Biden Build Back Better plan. But no, instead of that, what we're doing is giving money, more buckets and buckets of public money to insurance companies with very little accountability. And that, Mr. Chair, I cannot support. Thank you. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Chair Stevenson and members. I also have uh, concerns with this proposal. Um, we have dropped the study language for healthcare delivery reform that many of our members, that's why they voted for the bill off the House floor. We have dropped the proposal to look at a solution at the end of this bridge. Uh, this is still a bridge to nowhere. We need to build that solution. We can't keep putting general fund money, taxpayer money into subsidizing health plans. I think there's, there's gotta be a better solution. We need to start looking for that now, not later. Um, those pieces are very important and I um, am very disappointed that they're not in this package. Um, the other thing is I don't know what our caucus is getting for reinsurance because um, if the federal government fixes the BH form, PP, BHP formula, uh, we're not really getting a lot by putting money into the healthcare access fund. So I have real concerns that I, I don't see a win for um, many individuals in my caucus to support um, the, I don't know, $890 million subsidy to the health plans. Okay, uh, Senator Drahan. Senator Drahan, I, I at least cannot hear you. I don't know if others cannot as well. You're not muted, but you might be having some microphone difficulties. I'm still not hearing you. Uh, I'm gonna go to Senator Klein. We'll try and come back to you, Senator Dreheim. Senator Klein. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanna to speak to a couple aspects of the bill. You already spoke very clearly about the impact this would have on uh, premium rates for the 167,000 individuals who are currently in this market. Um, I share the general sense that uh, this is not a solution to our healthcare costs or to our healthcare delivery in the state of Minnesota. It is, however, the solution before us and it will prevent pain to those individuals uh, whose rates otherwise would go up considerably in October of this year. Uh, other proposals have been put out there. Senator Liebling, sorry, Representative Liebling referred to the federal tax credits to buy down premiums uh, with tax, advanced premium tax credits. And I did author a bill this year that would do that at the statewide level and bring them down to 5% in the state of Minnesota to individuals. So we do have proposals out there that can replace this over the three years uh, that we've paid for it in its current form. I wanted to speak specifically, Mr. Chair, just about one of the policy proposals because uh, as a physician, I think it's going to have a significant impact on my patients. And that is the, the flat co-pays provision from uh, Representative Bierman. Uh, I can speak personally that uh, I have individuals who have very high uh, deductibles at the start of their year and who are forced to pay you know, $8,000 or $10,000 in January and February of the year for medications that are life-saving and necessary and it does lead people to hard financial decisions uh, about whether to continue those medications or make other choices in their lives. Uh, those individuals have organized, they have advocated, they have uh, uh, appealed to us. Uh, I can speak personally about an individual I know whose uh, boy had childhood cancer 
uh, had very expensive medications that uh, were unaffordable in January and February of the year. Passing this provision today uh, will give immediate and very real relief to those individuals. It will help Minnesotans and they will be grateful. Uh, so those are my comments, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Hi, Senator Dreheim again. Okay. Senator Dreheim? Can you hear me now? I sure can, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I apologize. I, I wanted to start, uh, Chair, by first thanking you and, and Senator Deems for your hard work on this. Um, I know most of us wish we didn't have to do this, um, but it is a reaction um, to the federal government and, and what's happened over the years and what gaps we have um, for, for care across Minnesota, and especially in my district, you know, the rural areas, a um, lot of small mom and pop businesses, a lot of farmers. Uh, this is very important. Um, I, I know we've been emulated in other states. I know um, Congresswoman woman, uh, Craig has proposed proposals on the federal level, emulating this reinsurance. Um, so I, I think it is the best option we have. So once again, I just want to thank you. But it is a win for those farmers and, and small business owners out there. It really isn't about us or the house. It's about them. And like most votes up here, it, it's the best option that we have. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Representative Katiza Watoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also would like to start off by thanking you for all the work that we've done in committee so far this session and for your leadership on and reinsurance, among other things. Um, members, we know that reinsurance isn't a perfect program. My constituents have deep concerns that I share about the lack of oversight and accountability of usage of these state funds. Um, throughout years of discussion, we have yet to reach a better compromise to allow every Minnesotan access to high quality and affordable health care. Uh, this conference committee started at an impasse. The agreement before us today is lacking. It lacks my expansion of the board of directors, ensuring that Minnesotans have more of a voice at the table with the health plans. It lacks the mental health and substance abuse parity accountability office. It lacks a delivery reform analysis report. These proposals are meaningful to Minnesotans. They're meaningful to my constituents. These proposals would have contributed to a more holistic framework of where we go from here. But as a relatively new mother, the inclusion of expanded postpartum visits is also meaningful. As someone who has experienced living paycheck to paycheck, the inclusion of stabilization of prescription drug co-pays is meaningful. As someone who lost family health insurance coverage at college graduation prior to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and had to enter the private market, the fact that we are continuing to fund this imperfect solution while we continue to work on a better option is meaningful. I've told my constituents from day one that I cannot and will not agree to a blank check to the insurance industry. I've supported the continuation of reinsurance with hesitation, with incremental improvements. This compromise is lacking, but the policy inclusions within are incremental and meaningful, and this imperfect solution will help Minnesotans. We must continue to work together to find a more permanent solution for everyone across the state. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Katiza Watoon. Representative Schultz, did you have something? Yes, given the um, comments, I would like to make a motion to recess. Uh, no need for a motion. Uh, I take your suggestion. Uh, we will uh, have a brief recess to the call of the chair. Uh, I will give at least 15 minutes notice. The committee's in recess. <laughs>